so the proud heritage of Pittsburgh, I so strongly believe, reveals the character of our nation. A nation that harnesses the ambitions, the dreams, and the aspirations of our people. Seizes the opportunities before us because we see them because we believe in them, and then invents the future. That is what we have always done. And that is what we must now do. And I know we will. I thank you all for inviting me. May God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. It's 5 o'clock now in New York, a speech that wrapped up a little about 45 minutes ago. It is, of course, about the numbers, yes, the stuff you can count and measure, dollars, cents, jobs, costs, inflation, interest, an enormously complex quilt of interconnecting metrics. But in a political context, in a political campaign, at least as it relates to winning the campaign for president, the state of our shared economy is about so much more for the voters, not just what the numbers say, but about what people say, about what they feel, about their vibes about each candidate, for better or for worse. And it's for that very reason that the fight is on for the hearts and minds of the American people who just want more affordable groceries, more affordable gas, more affordable stuff. Behind curtain number one, Donald Trump, who would prefer voters ignore stabilizing prices of just about everything, lowering interest rates and rising wages. It's in his political interest for the American people to believe his version of the economy and the country, that they're both currently failing and that only he can fix it. Potentially catastrophic tariffs and all. And on the other side, the other choice, Vice President Kamala Harris is not only communicating the Biden administration's recent successes, but laying out her own plan for winning the future. And it looks like it's starting to work. As we mentioned, where for some time voters trusted Trump over Harris on matters related to the economy now, polls suggest the vice president is chipping away at that political advantage. Washington Post reports this, quote, Trump now averages a six percentage point edge on the economy compared with a 12 point lead against President Joe Biden earlier this year. According to an analysis of five polls that measured voters' opinions before and after Biden dropped out. Now, that dramatic transformation, what Mark Cuban called a turnaround in public sentiment, has coincided with a broader climb in favorability for Vice President Harris as well. Right now, our friend and colleague Stephanie Rule is talking, sitting down and interviewing Vice President Harris in one of her first major interviews of the cycle on this very topic. Steph will join us with a preview of that interview in just a minute. But first, one of the vice president's most powerful and I would say effective messengers on the issue of the economy, billionaire businessman Mark Cuban, who joined us during the last hour. Watch what he said about Vice President Harris's performance since she took over at the top of the Democratic ticket. I look at um, the Harris campaign as a company and Kamala is the CEO, right? She's, she's had, what, 45 days, 60 days to build an entire organization. And you look at the results. She went from negative favorability ratings. She went from recognition being relatively low. She went from being way behind in every single poll you looked at. And now look where she's at. Worst case, she's tied. In many cases, she's ahead. When you're able to turn around a battleship like a, a, a presidential campaign and go from being way behind to tied or ahead, you're doing a lot right. And on the flip side, if you had what seemed like an insurmountable lead and now you've given up that entire lead to another CEO, you're getting fired. Right. So I think that's the beautiful part of looking at what she's doing. She's run her campaign like a CEO. She's had success. And when I go to talk to the, uh, business people, that's what I tell them. She's actually running her organization like a CEO. And that's the evidence that you need to know that she'll be a great leader, that she understands business, that she understands organizations, and she'll be a friend and partner to business across the board. A ringing endorsement there. Joining our conversation, political columnist, host of the podcast In Politic for Puck, MSNBC National Affairs Analyst John Heilman is at the table for the hour, plus host of the Independent Americans podcast, founder and CEO of Independent Veterans of America, Paul Rykoff, also here for the hour. Joining us is writer and editor for Protect Democracy, Amanda Carpenter. Amanda, I start with you. 
Um, we were sort of chewing in the last hour of all the ways that this speech sort of speaks to important parts of the electorate. But it, 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 it a bigger sort of view of this is this is clearly a candidate in a campaign that sees itself very much on offense. Yeah, certainly. I mean, what is just continually striking to me, starting, you know, with the unveiling of this campaign when when she was when she claimed the nomination, um, is something that I think Cuban was pointing out is that she is running this as an organization and she is always signaling in ways that create the tent bigger um, than I think traditional liberal Democrats have in the past. I mean, the one part that really jumped out at the speech, I kept reading it. You know, she's promising a stable environment with consistent and transparent rules of the road and promises to cut needless bureaucracy and unnecessary red tape. I mean, that code's so hard, <laughs> Republican. It, it just is baffling to me that like this is the contrast to the Republican nominee in 2024, like embracing these common sense arguments that we need a stable environment so that business can thrive because the alternative um, is, is a lot of chaos and instability. I mean, it's such a clear cut dynamic, which is so interesting in a way that, you know, she doesn't have to do a lot of legwork here to appeal to those voters who are outside the traditional Democratic tent. Um, it's so interesting that Amanda picked up on that. I mean, I, I picked up on on her just sort of pinprick attacks on his record. I mean, here she is calling him calling him out on, on manufacturing. Donald Trump, well, he makes big promises on manufacturing. Just yesterday, he went out and promised to bring back manufacturing jobs. And if that sounds familiar, it should. In 2016, he went out and made that very same promise about the carrier plant in Indianapolis. You'll remember, carrier then offshored hundreds of jobs to Mexico under his watch. And it wasn't just there. On Trump's watch, offshoring went up and manufacturing jobs went down across our country and across our economy, all told, almost 200,000 manufacturing jobs were lost during his presidency, starting before the pandemic hit, making Trump one of the biggest losers ever on manufacturing. I can hear him typing somewhere over in the internet, <laughs> the darkest corners of Truth Social. Yeah. She called him the biggest loser. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I believe it's actually just true in the sense that um, uh, we were just talking about the fact that he, at some point that he lost a billion dollars, that, that one tax right. return, he lost a billion dollars, biggest individual tax uh, loss like ever claimed by a, a single person in American history. So a loser on a number of different levels, yeah. including in, in 2020. She, uh, uh, you know, there's a... When she became the de facto nominee um, and replaced Joe Biden, there was a discussion because it was very clear that Biden had only this one path to 270 electoral votes, and it was through these blue wall states. And people talked about how um, the, the the map could be expanded, and it has been expanded. But but what's been interesting, and some of the, the reason that people focused on that was they worried that maybe she wouldn't be as successful in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin as Joe Biden had been back in 2020, uh, because these are these older, whiter states, et cetera. And something kind of really interesting has happened along the way, and I, I, this is not as much of a non sequitur as it seems, because it comes back to this economic message, is that she's gotten stronger in yeah. Michigan. And, and increasingly, we have seen some really good polls for her in Pennsylvania. She's yeah. looked strong. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, she continues to be really strong in those places. And in fact, is, is, is weaker, relatively speaking, in, in Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. And I think there, you know, people are puzzling, scratching their heads over why this is. And it, it, I think that a lot of people in the campaign and other places view that as a reflection of the fact that the, the manufacturing economy in the Midwest has benefited from Joe Biden's policies in a very direct way. Then there have been lots of, you know, there's lots of things to say about the perceptions of the economy in the country. But in that region, the manufacturing base has really has really benefited from Biden, from chips and from other things. And so she's is a place where she can piggyback on Biden's record. And as she also kind of hits Trump on the failures that he had, Mr. Manufacturing, Mr. Builder guy, mm -hmm. um, it's it's been it's really worked to her advantage. And it's it, the interesting challenge now for her is to continue to take that economic message and use it 
that she, the message she's putting out and, and then trying to deal with some of these issues around immigration that are, uh, that are going to be a problem in places like Arizona, which is where she's weakest right now in Nevada. Um, but it really has been fascinating to see her, that the blue wall continues to be solid, um, as, as solid as anything is in this very close environment yeah. for her.